Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, yet another session on the tafsir of Surah Al Anbiya. Alhamdulillah, we have reached uh, verse number 50, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wahada dhikrum mubarakun anzalna afa'antum lahu munkirun. This, the Quran, is a blessed reminder that we have sent down. Will you then deny it? If you recall, in, uh, in the previous verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the discussion on the past prophets by mentioning Musa and Harun. In ayah number 48, Allah said, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا مُوسَى وَهَارُونَ الْفُرْقَانِ We gave, and indeed we gave Moses and Aaron the criterion, which was which served as a source of light and a reminder for the pious. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Musa alayhi salam many things that helped people distinguish between truth and falsehood. Allah equipped Musa alayhi salam with many miracles. This is the same Musa whose staff turned into a serpent. This is the same Musa who was able to split the Red Sea. But among all of the things that Allah Azza wa Jal gave to Musa, Allah mentions that the most powerful ayah, the most powerful sign, the most powerful furqan that was given to Musa was the Torah, that this was really the most important sign that was given to him. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the Prophet, he's essentially telling the Prophet that these mushrikeen are going to ask you to perform many different miracles. They're going to ask you to perform supernatural acts. But indeed, the greatest sign that you can give to them is the Qur'an. In the same way that the most important sign given to Musa was the Torah, the most important hujjah, the most important ayah, the most important miracle that was given to you is the Qur'an. Wahada and this Qur'an, in the same way that the Torah was a furqan, it was a criterion, it was light, and it was a reminder, وَهَذَا ذِكْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ This Qur'an is a blessed reminder. And the word, the word baraka, you know, it, it refers to this idea of, uh, of something that uh, provides perpetual goodness. It, can, it c- continuously gives khayr. And it has this enduring element. So something that continuously gives goodness and something that endures. وَهَذَا ذِكْرٌ مُبَارَكٌ That this is a blessed reminder that we have given to you. أَنزَلْنَاهُ That it is something that we have set down. That this Qur'an is something that comes from a divine source. أَفَأَنْتُمْ لَهُ munkirun. Allah then asks these people that... Will you, is this, is this the thing that you're denying? Will you then deny this? And if you look at the sentence structure of أَفَأَنْتُمْ لَهُ مُنْكِرُونَ So number one, it's a nominal sentence. It doesn't begin with a verb, at least this last part. أَفَأَنْتُمْ لَهُ مُنْكِرُونَ And this also, Allah introduces an abnormal sentence structure here. Normally, the, it, it, would, it would make sense to say, أَفَأَنْتُمْ مُنْكِرُونَ لَهُ But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the لَهُ أَفَأَنْتُمْ لَهُ مُنْكِرُونَ It means that you seem to only deny this. You are so naive and you will accept anything. You're, you claim to be so open-minded that you will accept anything. You will accept the possibility of anything being true except this Qur'an. Highlighting the, the stubbornness of this, these people. So Allah is essentially saying, Oh Muhammad, the greatest miracle that we have given to you is the Qur'an. So be confident in, in it. In the same way that the greatest miracle that we gave to Musa 
was the Torah. وهذا ذكر مبارك أنزلناه أفأنتم له منكرون. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 51. So again, Allah is going to mention many different prophets. And there are about 16 prophets who are mentioned in the surah. Now you may ask, why does Allah begin with Musa? As, as you'll see, the next ayah will speak about Ibrahim. So we understand that the mentioning of these prophets is not going to be in chronological order. Allah begins by telling Rasulullah about Musa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by telling the Prophet about Musa. Why does he begin with Musa? Perhaps because among all of the Prophets, there are more commonalities between Rasulullah and Musa. That the challenges that they faced were, were very similar. And that's that's probably why that Musa is the most mentioned prophet in the Quran, that the Israelites are the most mentioned community. It's because the circumstances that Musa faced, the challenges that he had to uh, encounter were very similar to what the Holy Prophet had to face. Ayah number 51, Allah then speaks about Ibrahim. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَكُنَّا بِهِ عَالِمِينَ and we, in, we indeed gave to Abraham his sound judgment before, aforetime, and we knew him. Now, Ibrahim السلام, is mentioned in many places in the Quran. There are many chapters in the Quran that speak of the life of, uh, of Ibrahim. In fact, there is an entire surah in the Quran named after Ibrahim. The 14th surah of the Quran is Surah Ibrahim. Ibrahim alayhi salam was rigorous, rigorously tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Probably more than any, any prophet other than Rasulullah. You see in, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, verse 124, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُ That Allah tested Ibrahim through many different trials. He put him through many trials. Some of the trials we don't know about, but there are some that are mentioned in the Quran, which were very difficult trials that he experienced. So for example, which is the story we're gonna mention, you know, him challenging the, uh, the concept of idol worship in a society that was predominantly polytheistic. So this is also a test to be able to hold on to your faith to adhere to monotheism, even, even when something is unpopular. It's being steadfast, even when the rest of society is going in another direction. So not the idea of not conforming to the, uh, the opinions of the majority. You know, the idea of going along to get along. Ibrahim السلام, was firm in his faith. Secondly, we find that Ibrahim السلام, he lived almost his entire life without children. That was another trial for him, that Allah did not give him children early on. He used to ask Allah, you know, Rabbi hadli min as Oh Allah, grant me a righteous progeny. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him a son by the name of Ismail, he's instructed to take Hajar and to take Ismail and leave them in the middle of a barren desert. This was a test. Allah mentions this in Surah Ibrahim, Surah 14, Ayah number 37. رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْعٍ عَنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَمِ Oh Allah, I have left, O oh my Lord, I have left a part of my progeny in a desolate land. And this is not easy. You know, when, you, when, when it comes to your first child, imagine how attached you are to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test the devotion of Ibrahim. That are you willing to sacrifice for my sake? How much are you willing to sacrifice? And this same Ibra uh, Ibrahim who had to leave Hajar and Ismail in Mecca, when Ismail grows up, again, Ibrahim sees this dream. Surah Safat, Surah 37, Ayah number 102. 
فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعْهُ السَّعِي قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ إِنِّي أَذْبَحُكْ فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى He sees that vision of himself sacrificing his son. So you see that there are many instances in the life of Ibrahim السلام, where he's tested. His love for God is tested. His, willing to his willingness to sacrifice is tested. The strength of his iman is tested in, in the idea of not conforming to the majority. Now, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recounts an incident that took place in the, in the early years of uh, Ibrahim's life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next few verses will speak about his conversation with his uncle and with his people concerning their, uh, their worship of idols. Now Allah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ And indeed we gave to Ibrahim his sound judgment before. The word rushd is mentioned. Now the word rushd is very similar to the word hidayah. So, so in, many of you may know that in Islamic jurisprudence we have this concept of maturity, physical maturity, which is, which is known as bulugh. So someone who has reached the age of physical maturity, whether it's for males or females, and there are certain indicators of that, of reaching physical maturity, we call that bulugh. Someone who is physically mature is baligh. Rushd seems to speak about mental maturity. And it's a very specific type of mental maturity. So someone might be physically mature, but they're not mentally and intellectually mature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that when Ibrahim was young, he had this mental maturity. He had this rushd. And rushd is very similar to the word hidayah, but there is a subtle difference. Some have said that hidayah that someone who is guided is someone who has been shown the path. So hidayah denotes the idea of being shown the path. Whereas rushd is to actually walk that path. So not only was Ibrahim guided, not only did he know the truth, not only was he shown the path, but he was walking that path. He was acting on what he knew. And the ayah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ رُشْدَهُ We indeed gave to Abraham his sound judgment. So rushd seems to be attributed to him and it, it, it almost implies that, you know, is, you know, if rushd, if this intellectual, spiritual, mental maturity, if it was an object, you know, figuratively, Ibrahim had this quality that it's as though Rushd is an object and Ibrahim is possessing it. He has full control over it. That, that Ibrahim السلام, exhibited this maturity, this Rushd, even before he officially began his prophetic mission. And this is also a reminder that prophets, even before they begin their prophetic missions, they are infallible. So before Musa السلام, was commanded by Allah to go back to Fir'aun, Fir'aun innahu So even though Musa السلام, was told to go to Pharaoh, it's not that you know, he, he became mentally mature when he was appointed as a prophet, that Ibrahim السلام, had these qualities even before he officially began his prophetic mission. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and, and at the end of the ayah, Allah says, وَكُنَّا بِهِ عالمين, And we knew Ibrahim. We appointed him to Nubuwa and Risala and we made him Khalil and we, we made him an Imam eventually. And we didn't just give him these positions arbitrarily. We knew that Ibrahim السلام, had the aptitude, he had the capacity to fulfill these responsibilities. 
Allah in Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 124, he says, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. God, Allah knows where to place his message. He knows who is worthy and who is qualified to be the bearer of his message, to be a recipient of revelation. We knew Ibrahim. And this applies to all prophets. They all had this rushd even before they officially uh, began their prophetic mission. In ayah number 52, Allah gives us an example of the mental and the intellectual and the spiritual maturity of Ibrahim. When he said to his father and his people, what are these sculptures to which you are cleaving? Now, in the translation it says, and, we, and, and when he said to his father, however, father here is not his biological father, because the word eb in the Arabic language can also refer to an uncle. It can refer to a teacher. teacher. It can refer to a religious scholar. Now the word walid can only refer to the biological father. But the word eb in Arabic can be applied to others and not only the, uh, the biological father. Similarly, in the, uh, in the English language, even you know, the priest is referred to as father, even though the priest is not the biological father. So we have this similar uh, usage, this expansive usage in, uh, in the Arabic language. Now this uncle, his name was Azar. Ibrahim's biological father, even according to biblical accounts, was Tarikh, who was a monotheist. We believe that all prophets, their parents and their forefathers, they come from the loins and from the wombs of monotheists all of them without exception. Azar, the uncle of, the uncle of, uh, of Ibrahim, was a polytheist. And subhanAllah, you see the parallels that the Prophet also has, you know, Abu, Abu Lahab, who was a polytheist. So you see Allah is kind of consoling the Prophet that what you're going through is similar to what Ibrahim went through. So this uncle was a polytheist, but not only was it Azar, a polytheist, he used to be an idol maker. He was manufacturing idols. So he says to his, his, uh, his uncle and uh, his people, what are these sculptures? And he uses the word tamathil. He doesn't call them asnam. He says tamathil. Because a timthal is a sculpture and it, it implies that you're worshipping something that is lifeless. It doesn't even have life. You have an advantage over these idols. You are a living being and you are worshiping something that is lifeless. And not only are you, not only are you worshiping these, uh, these tamafi, these sculptures, Ibrahim says, They are not only worshiping, they are, they are akifun. The word akafa means to halt or to stop or to, or to stop something. And this is, we get the word i'tikaf from akafa. You know, when we have the, the practice, the, the spiritual retreats that we perform where we stay in the masjid for three days, the practice of i'tikaf is derived from this word. And it's, it's a type of worship characterized by full devotion. So these idol worshipers, were so committed to the worship of these idols that it's as though these idols were the center of their lives. They were fully devoted to them. So he asks them, almost, he says, what are these sculptures that you are cleaving to? What is their response? I number 53. They said to Ibrahim, we found our fathers, our forefathers, worshipping them. 
Abaana, our fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers, our ancestors, laha abidin. They don't use a verb to describe the, their uh, their ancestors' worship. They use a noun, abidin. They don't say they didn't say wajadna abaana uh, because a verb attaches a verb is related to time generally. A noun, when a noun is being used, it, it has the idea of permanence built into it, meaning that they've always been like this. They've always worshipped and devoted themselves to these, uh, these idols. So their argument is what? This is our culture. And, and oftentimes, you know, this is the response of, of most people when you, when you want to address certain problems in a community, if you want to point out, you know, uh, corruption or unethical practices, people always invoke tradition or culture, you know, and, and it, you know, especially if you tell them that, oh, you know, this is un-Islamic, they say, this is our culture. And the same, the same attitude, we find the same attitude with the polytheists. They say, What is Ibrahim saying? So he says, why are you worshipping these sculptures? They say it's our culture, it's, what our, it's our custom, it's, it's the tradition of our forefathers. Ibrahim salam, what does he say? Does he say, oh, you know, since it's culture, we have to respect culture, that's your tradition, that's your custom? No. He says, certainly you and your forefathers have been in manifest error. So their argument was, this is our culture. Ibrahim alayhi salam is essentially saying to them that just because something is a tradition, just because something is part of your culture or it's a custom, it doesn't mean that it has an inherent sanctity. No cultural practice, no tradition is above scrutiny. But that is, that is a ridiculous argument. Ibrahim says, yes, okay. This is the tradition of, uh, this is your tradition and the tradition of, you, uh, of, of your forefathers. Ibrahim very simply, very clearly says to them, very bluntly says, in that case, without a doubt, you and your forefathers are in error. You guys are wrong. Don't, don't, invoke, don't invoke culture as an excuse to continue illogical practices. Now, again, Islam, the prophets were not against culture, right? If you look at the Prophet ﷺ, there were cultural practices during the time of Jahiliyyah that he endorsed, that, you know, not fighting in the four sacred months. This is a good cultural practice to promote. But we don't promote things just because they're culture. We promote things based on truth, based on reality, based on the goodness that it offers to society. In ayah number 55, we see the response of the mushrikeen during the time of Ibrahim. Ayah number 55, They said, have you brought us the truth? Are you serious? Or are you among those who jest? So they were so astonished by how bold and how blunt Ibrahim was that they couldn't even believe that he was criticizing something that has been accepted by generations. You see that the shirk was so deep-rooted. It was so embedded in their, in their mindset, in their worldview, that they couldn't even... If someone were to even question idol worship, their their response was, "What? Are you serious? Are you are you are you speaking the truth, or are you are you serious? Are you serious, or are you joking?" So this shows you that shirk was part and parcel of their of their culture, of their mentality. The fact that 
Ibrahim even questioned this tradition was unbelievable to them. So they say to him, you know, are you serious? Or are you just pulling our legs? Or are you joking around? In ayah number 56, قَالَ بَلْ رَبُّكُمْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ الَّذِي فَطَرَهُنَّ وَأَنَا عَلَى ذَلِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّاهِدِينَ He said, no, nay, but your Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth who originated them. And I am, I, and I am among those who bear witness to this. He says that, no, I'm not joking with you. You worship these idols because you see them as your providers, your sustainers. Your real provider is not, the, not these idols. In fact, you have to care for them. You built this temple for them. You created them. You built them. They do nothing for you. On the contrary, you have to provide and you have to protect these idols. So he says, your Rabb, your cherisher, your sustainer, your provider is the one who provides and sustains. He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. One of the names of Allah is Al-Fatir. So Allah is Al-Khaliq and he is Al-Fatir. Al-Khaliq means the one who creates the one who brings something into being. But fatara is also similar to khalaqa, but it, it, it denotes, it conveys the idea that what is being created is original. It, it's not something that's a replica. That Allah created the heavens and the earth without any previous example to go off of. That Allah created everything purely original you know car manufacturers when they want to design a car when they want to create a car when they want to build a car they they follow the the uh, the design they imitate already pre-existing designs but allah when he creates he does not imitate any pre-existing design everything that he creates is original it's fresh. It's unlike anything else. He's the one who originated the heavens and the earth. And I am, and I bear witness to this. I bear witness to this. So, ayah number 57, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he tries to engage in Argumentation. He tries to use logical arguments with the polytheists. But again, his words fall on deaf ears. He says in ayah number 57, Ibrahim says, and by God, I shall scheme against your idols after you have turned your backs. What does Ibrahim mean when he says, after you have turned your backs? Now, it seems that the polytheists in the Mesopotamian area, in the area of the region in Babylon, they used to have an annual or a semi-annual festival where they would go, they would leave food with uh, the idols and they would go out of the city and they would celebrate and then they would return and eat from that food. They would wanna eat that blessed food, the provisions that they would present to the idols. So they would all leave the city. Ibrahim alayhi salam, again, he tried verbal argumentation with them, now he is planning to use a different mode of demonstration. So he told them that these idols cannot do anything for you, they cannot provide for you. Words 
were not effective. Now he's going to give them a demonstration. And he threatens that he is going to scheme against uh, these, uh, these idols, that he's going to do something to, to demonstrate how futile and how worthless these, uh, you know, this type of worship is. If you go to Surat Safat, Surah 37, verses 85 to 89, the conversation that was mentioned earlier between Ibrahim and his uncle and his people is also summarized, it's, it's mentioned. Verses 85 to 89 in Surah Safat, إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ تَعْبُدُ When Ibrahim said to his uncle, his father, and his people, what are you worshipping? ماذا تعبدون? أَإِفْكًا آلِهَةً دُونَ اللَّهِ تُرِيدُونَ Do you want other gods other than the, the one true God? فَمَا ظَنُّكُمْ بِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ What is your opinion about the Lord of the worlds? فَنَظَرَ نَظَرَةً فِي النُّجُونَ So again, it's giving a very summarized version of the story. Now, as I mentioned, all of them were leaving the city during that festival, and they wanted Ibrahim to join. فَنَظَرَ نَظَرَةً فِي النُّجُومِ He looked, he glanced at the stars. فَقَالَ إِنِّي سَقِيمٌ He gave them an excuse as to why he's not joining them. He said that I'm, I'm ill, I'm not feeling well. Now, there's a debate among scholars. Was he really sick? We have a narration from Imam al-Sadiq saying that, no, he wasn't sick. He... he what he intended, he meant that he was, he felt spiritually sick of, of their idol worship. In any case, Ibrahim السلام, makes an excuse to remain behind, to remain in the city while everyone leaves and attends uh, the festival. And uh, so Ibrahim says in ayah number 57, وَتَاللَّهِ He makes a qasim. That I will scheme against your, your idols. Now, the word sanam in the Arabic language, usually when the word sanam is used, we think of physical idols. But we have a hadith attributed to the Ahlul Bayt where they say the word sanam has a much more broad meaning. They say, كُلَّمَا شَغِلَكَ عَنِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ صَنَمُكَ Anything, Ahlul Bayt, they say anything that distracts you from God, that takes your attention away from the divine, that preoccupies you, that makes you heedless of God, that thing is your idol. So people have different idols. Could be money. It could be work for some people. It could be a physical idol. It could be, you know, an, an ideology, a system, whatever it may be. Anything that distracts you from God is your idol. Asbagh ibn Nubata, he says that I was with Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Imam salam was passing by a group of people who were playing chess. And as you know, people who play chess Usually they spend hours and hours, you know, playing uh, this board game because it's a game of strategy and oftentimes people gamble. They bet money on, on chess matches. If you go online, you know, so if you go online, you'll find that, you know, chess has become wedded with, uh, with gambling. In any case, people spend a lot of time. They waste a lot of many hours playing this game. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he passes by a group of people who were playing chess. They were engrossed by this, uh, this board game. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says to them, he uses the same expression as Ibrahim. مَا هَذِهِ التَّمَاثِيلُ الَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَاكِفُونَ What are these sculptures that you guys are cleaving to? That you, are, you guys are so devoted to? لَقَدْ عَصَيْتُمُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَ That you have disobeyed God and his messenger, because these, this game has made you completely heedless of your responsibility towards God and his messenger. Ayah number 58, illa kabiran lahum la'allahum ilayhi yarjoon. 
Ayah number 58, after the polytheists, they leave the city. Ibrahim, who's a youth at the time, he's a young man. Again, Allah is giving us an example of his sound judgment, his rushd, his mental maturity, his sharp intelligence. The ayah says, so he broke them into pieces. He broke the idols inside of the temple. All of them, he, he shattered them into pieces, except the largest of them. فَجَعَلَهُمْ جُذَاذًا جُذَاذًا It's not just that he hit the idol and broke into two big pieces. Judadan means to break something into small pieces. So Ibrahim really went to town on these idols. He, he pulverized them. He shattered them into small little pieces. Except for the largest idol. He preserved the large idol. And other narrations say that he tied the hammer that he used around the, uh, the big idol. Why did he do this? لَعَلَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ يَرْجِعُونَ so that they would return to him. Now there's a discussion among the Mufassireen about who is meant by the pronoun him, ilayhi. Ilayhi refers to who? So that perhaps he did this so, they, so that they can return to him. One of the, the beautiful features of the Quran is that sometimes an ayah, a, a phrase, can refer has has many possible meanings, and all of them could be intended. That sometimes Allah uses an expression, and in this one expression, He is He means multiple things. So some scholars say that so that perhaps they may return to Him, meaning return to the largest idol. So they can return, and we see that this happens in the story. Ibrahim alayhi salam he. They say, you know, what happened? Who did this to our idols? Ibrahim says, ask the large idol if he can speak. Ask him if he's able to speak. So, ilayhi, some say it refers to the large idol. Others say that ilayhi refers to Ibrahim. They didn't take him seriously when he was arguing with them. They just said, yeah, 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 and they just left. So perhaps they can come back to him and have a serious conversation about whether or not these idols are worthy of worship. A third opinion is ilayhi means, so perhaps they may return to Allah. They may go back to their primordial nature. They may, they may go back to their fitrah. But there's no reason why ilayhi could also mean all of them. Because in the story, as we will find when we, when we uh, examine the, the next verses, you'll find that they essentially returned to all of them. So they returned to the idol, they returned to Ibrahim, and Ibrahim was hoping for them to discover Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through, uh, through this demonstration. I think we'll, uh, we'll stop there. Uh, we'll continue our discussion uh, next week. Uh, if anyone has any questions, inshallah, I'll, uh, I'll take them uh, uh, in our next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and give you the tawfiq to draw inspiration and enlightenment from the Qur'an. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us in this uh, Qur'anic uh, reflection session. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin.